Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Radwin. I'm super excited to be here at the Open Data Science Conference. Um, and I want to share with you a few stories about how we've applied design thinking uh, and data science to create great AI-driven products. And I'm hoping that you can learn some of these, take some of these lessons and apply them to your own organizations as well. So let's start off with a little bit of audience participation. Can I get a show of hands? How many of you love doing your taxes? Raise your hand. I'm the only guy in the room with my hand up, right? OK, or maybe one other. Great. So why, why do we not love doing our taxes? Well, um, accountants love the intricacies and details of tax preparation. But the rest of us, we like to say that taxes are something that are required but not desired. And actually, this is true of many, many things in the financial industry space. So why, what's a guy from Intuit doing, doing here talking to you about this stuff? Well, um, we've been building financial software for the past 35 years. And we try to power the prosperity of consumers, small businesses, and the self-employed. And in that space of required but not desired, um, you might have used one of our products, like Mint or QuickBooks or TurboTax. We have to find a way to help you to get these tasks done in a way that's also su super compelling for you as well. So how many of you remember Microsoft Clippy? OK, a few more hands went up. I guess people really don't like doing their taxes. So, the artificial intelligence behind Clippy was actually pretty sophisticated for the era, for the late 1990s, but the user interface left something to be desired. And so data scientists are people who have this, these strong backgrounds in statistics and mathematics and software engineering. They work at the intersection of these spaces. And great designers have creativity and aesthetic sense and they also deeply understand customers and what customers' needs are and, and, and how to get empathy for them. But each discipline, data science and design, comes with a very, very different set of mindsets, tools, practices, behaviors, its own language. So how can we get these two disciplines, data science and design, to come together? So the answer that I want to walk you through today is something called design thinking. And at Intuit, we have a pretty simplified version of design thinking, which we call Design for Delight. It's a methodology that we use to innovate at Intuit. Um, the Stanford University D School is probably the originator of design thinking. And they, they teach this methodology for creative problem solving. And we teach Design for Delight to our teams to help them to build really, really great products uh, across um, all of the different disciplines and help them deliver that benefit to the customer. So D for D has got three components, and I'm going to walk you through each of these three components in some detail. The first is deep customer empathy. The second is called go broad to go narrow. And the third is to run rapid experiments with customers. So let's jump in and talk about the first principle. Deep customer empathy is, is it helps us to get inspired and to embrace the unexpected. So we start by getting a deeper understanding of our customer and understand what, their, their customer, what that customer's pain points are. That means observing and engaging with the customer to get a really unfiltered view of what their challenges happen to be. And ideally, the best place to do this is in their own native ab habitat, their own natural habitat. So you go and visit them, whether they're a small business or a consumer or something. You actually go and visit them, visit them wherever they are solving their problem. You, don't, you try not to bring them to your lab if you can. With that deep customer empathy, design thinkers begin to actually set aside their biases and intuition and actually really begin to walk a mile in the customer's shoes. And then that helps them to solve or, or begin to, to think about the problem in human-centric terms, not in product-centric terms or, 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 or technology-centric terms. And then this gives us the inspiration to come up with solutions that can actually really uh, benefit the customer and, and help to solve those problems. So now that we've got a really, really deep empathy for the customer, and we understand the customer maybe even better than the customer understands themselves, what's the second step? So the second principle or the second part of Design for Delight is what we call go broad to go narrow. So only after gathering, analyzing, and synthesizing what all the customer's deep pain points and what their real unique problem is, then we can start to actually look for solutions. This phase in the process is all about stimulating free thinking and about expanding the problem space 
about generating lots and lots of ideas for exploration. So we have a belief that in order to get one good idea, you have to start with lots of ideas. And the trick is to go for quantity first, not quality, but then have a really good process for synthesizing and narrowing and going, going down to the one or two or three that are really good ideas, and then you want to begin to test. And actually, that, begins, that brings us to the third part of Design for Delight. So De Design for Delight part three is around rapid experiments with customers. So rapid experiments help you to make better decisions based on actual user behaviors. So, and we know that decisions are always better when they're based on facts versus conjecture. And experiments are often the best way to collect that, that, those facts, to collect that data. So experiments can help us to discover the truth before we go off and really build the product for real. They help, uh, they help the teams get aligned on what's actually going to work for the customer. This is the point where we start to do rapid prototyping and some A-B testing. And by putting those rapid prototypes in the hands of real customers, we can see how people behave, how they react, and how they respond to the expected or the unexpected. And this helps us to find opportunities to do better with the next build. You don't need a ton of people in order to do this rapid prototyping. You can, get it, you can bring in, go and meet three or four customers. You can bring them into your lab um, and actually run these prototypes on the fly with just a pen and paper. These rapid experiments help us to keep the project rooted in the real world. So these are the three principles of Design for Delight. Deep customer empathy, go broad to go narrow, and rapid experiments with customers. So the principles are actually pretty easy to learn. I've given them to you in just five minutes. Um, but they require quite a bit of discipline uh, to put them into practice. So on the Intuit Labs website, we've published a few method cards. These are actually some, some details that help you to understand each of the three principles and how to actually put them into practice. One example, and I won't go through it now, but you can look it up, is something called the Next Tool. This helps you to identify what are called your leap of faith assumptions. These are the key facts or assumptions that you might have made that you actually need to go out and test. And these are the key hypotheses that you'll either validate or invalidate, which will help you to move yourself through that iteration of learning and building and, and getting, going back to the drawing board and coming up with the next great design. So now that I've shared a brief introduction to what design thinking is and what the three principles of Design for Delight are, let's take a look at three examples of how we've applied design thinking to AI and machine learning problems at Intuit. So the first example comes from Mint, and this is where we've blended design and data science to solve a problem around overdrafting your checking account. From analyzing Mint transaction data, our teams found that many Mint users are paying huge amounts of overdraft fees to their banks when they don't have enough money in their checking account uh, when they, and they're trying to make a purchase. Mint users are spending something like $250 million a year in the US just to the five largest banks. Uh, and these fees are often $35 each time you overdraft. So imagine going to buy a $3 cup of coffee, and that cup of coffee turns into a $38 cup of coffee. So this actually happens, and it happens a lot. Fully 50% of the overdrafts are triggered by a transaction less than $50. So if you're living paycheck to paycheck, these overdraft fees can be a huge financial burden. So in keeping with the company's mission to power prosperity around the world, we said, let's use AI and machine learning. Let's build a machine learning model to predict whether a customer is going to overdraft. And maybe we can help them out. Maybe we can sol help solve this problem for them. And in fact, actually, we did. We went and built a supervised machine learning model. We used XGBoost, which is one of our favorite algorithms. And we collected a ton of data, a bunch of income and balance data. We looked back over the last day, week, 30 days, et cetera, and hundreds and hundreds of features. And we got pretty good, actually quite good, precision and recall. To instill confidence in our customers, we knew that we had to get um, really, really good in that prediction accuracy and in timeliness. And like in any model, you have to make a decision about um, uh, this trade-off between precision and recall. So we actually opted, in this case, to go for super high precision, which ended up reducing the recall a bit. But this was the right design choice from a data science model perspective. And then once we know which users are likely to overdraft, we want to send them an alert so they can take some action and, and, and not overdraft. Maybe they can transfer money between accounts, they can borrow money, they can shift their spending from a debit card to a credit card, et cetera. 
uh, I'll take questions at the end. So uh, the, the team went and actually built a really great machine learning model, but it turned out that actually that wasn't enough. Um, through rapid experimentation, we learned that the alerts we were sending actually weren't working, that we were telling customers they were going to overdraft, but we didn't get it right. Like, they didn't actually take the action. We didn't have the effect that we wanted to have. Even though the model predicted, and in fact, two or three days later, that customer did overdraft, we, it wasn't working, right? We really wanted to save the customer money and prevent them from overdrafting. So we learned actually a lot that the design of the experience mattered a ton. We needed simpler, shorter text. We needed a really clear call to action. And we even used a behavioral economics principle called loss aversion to help inspire the customers to actually take action. And the results are impressive. Once we iterated with the Design for Delight methodology, we were able to save Mint users over a million dollars in the past year. Um, and what I want to sort of hammer the point home here is that better design actually led to a bigger improvement than tweaking the model and making the data science better. Once we, once we rolled out a better uh, alert and design experience, we actually saw the users incur half as many overdrafts as the previous experience did. So design really mattered. The second example I want to share with you guys comes from QuickBooks Self-Employed. And this has to do with mileage tracking. So the IRS lets you tax deduct any, any business trips, any driving that you do for, for your small business or if you're self-employed. And at 54 cents a mile, actually that deduction can really add up if you drive a lot for work. Our QuickBooks self-employed mobile application already had this built-in GPS tracking thing that could track every one of your trips. However, users needed to figure out and separate which were the trips that were personal trips and which were the trips that were business trips. Because the IRS requires that you go through each business trip and say how many, what was the day, how many miles, what was the short description of the trip. So we, ha we had the, the, the core functionality in terms of collecting the trip data, but users still had to go through a pretty tedious and manual process. We did come up with a nice UI, which is they had to swipe left if there was a business trip and swipe right if it was a personal trip. Um, but they still had to go through and manually review all of these trips. So we thought, what can we use machine learning to help solve the problem? And we wanted to set it out, we wanted to set out and make it easier for these customers. And to be able to, to review the, these things without having to do so much work. And so we ended up using an algorithm called frequent pattern mining, which automatically helps us to automatically group business trips and personal trips together, and then they can be reviewed in bulk. So in a super, super simplified version for slideware, imagine this uh, sort of collection of, of business trips for a given user. And here's, here's a pattern that the algorithm detects where all trips that start in location A and end in location B and happen to be during a weekday, those qualify as a business expense. As a result, when a new trip is tracked with similar field values from the previous results, then the algorithm can predict, okay, this one is gonna be a business trip versus a, a, a personal trip. Um, the frequent padding, pattern mining algorithm actually worked really well. Uh, it compresses the data nicely. It run, there's a Hadoop algorithm, so it runs, it, it parallelizes well, and so we, we got the data science right. But again, we, we realized that getting the data science right isn't enough to actually deliver the benefit for the customer. We went back to the Design for Delight methodology and, and went back to the deep customer empathy. We wanted to get into the mindset of what was a small business or a self-employed user doing when they're trying to figure out what was tax deductible and what wasn't. We also did a bunch of rapid prototyping. We wanted to figure out what would make sense in terms of reviewing groups of trips versus individual trips. In each iteration, we both tweaked the design and actually the design experience, actually going and meeting with customers, helped to influence tweaks that we made to the frequent pattern mining algorithm. So the design experience actually influenced how well the data science model performed in production. And we couldn't actually do this if the data scientists were in the back room designing the algorithm completely independently from the designers. They had to come together to build this experience. We came up with a simple design and a clear call to action, and now it's easier than ever for customers to identify groups of trips. So we're actually able to save significant time during those 100 trips that each one of them reviews, and they're able to actually get that benefit of that big tax deduction. The third example I want to share with you comes from TurboTax. And this is a story from a couple of years ago that surprised us. It's around standard deductions versus itemized deductions. 
For many Americans, the tax refund is the biggest paycheck of the year. I'm gonna say that again because it might surprise some of you. I pay taxes to the US government every year, but actually I'm not a typical American and actually neither are many of you. Over 80% of taxpayers actually get a refund check from the US government. And that refund check for many of them is the biggest paycheck they get in the year. So it's super important that they, that they have the confidence that they're getting every penny they deserve because that paycheck matters quite a lot to them. So when preparing their taxes, one of the key questions they have to sort out is, should I take the standard deduction or, or should I go through the effort to itemize? Itemizing might get me a bigger refund and I really want every penny, but man, it takes a long time to do. So filling out those itemized deductions actually not only can take more time, but sometimes actually it, it results in a smaller refund. Actually, sometimes the bigger refund comes from the standard deduction. It's a bit counterintuitive, lots of things about taxes are. Um, and, and, and so what we did is we built a machine learning model to figure out and recommend should you take the standard deduction or should you take the itemized deduction just based on the, the questions we were asking in the regular tax interview process. So we built this machine learning model. We had over 600 features. We had incredible accuracy. We were able to predict really, really well, just a few minutes into the customer experience, should this customer take the standard deduction path or the itemized deduction path. And we thought that the, that the users would accept TurboTax's recommendation. After all, these are the same consumers out there who are used to using things like Amazon or Netflix or Spotify, so they're used to getting recommendations. But we were wrong. It turned out the tax filers, filers didn't trust the instant answer that we gave them it turned out that they weren't doing enough work. So we would say, oh, go take the standard deduction and here's the reason why, and they didn't believe it. They, they, they thought that TurboTax didn't have enough information to accurately predict. And so through a bunch of qualitative studies and through the design for delight methodology, we actually realized that users were more comfortable doing more work. And we figured out a way to, to get them to do more work without making them do too much more work. So, through rapid prototyping and through this deep customer empathy, we figured out a way to ask them just five questions. And these questions are really simple questions to answer. They don't require digging through piles and piles of paper and, and entering line 17 from form X, Y, Z. Um, and we asked them these questions about a, a few small things. And, and these questions could be answered in just a very short, short amount of time, just a minute or two. But doing this extra work made all of the difference. Suddenly, the tax filers, instead of rejecting our recommendation, actually took our recommendation. 96% of TurboTax users, when they went through the extra screen to do the extra work to answer these questions, ended up taking the standard deduction recommendation. And that's great because they got every penny they deserve. They got the bigger refund. But what's also great is that we saved them collectively about half a million hours of tax prep drudgery. They didn't have to go through and itemize everything. Machine learning was able to help them to solve the problem, get the bigger refund, and save their time. So again, blending data science and design thinking actually led to a better result than just data science alone or good design alone. So in closing, we've looked at three examples of how we blended data science with design thinking in order to deliver AI features that really work. When data scientists and designers come together and sort of work together and, and try to use a common language, we can deliver customer success. And that's really where that design for delight methodology comes in. Deep customer empathy, go broad to go narrow, and rapid experiments with customers. Thanks for your time today. So I, we have about five minutes, and I'm happy, to take, we, I'm happy to take a few questions. Do you typically include your data scientists in the design thinking sessions with the customer? Do you have a separate set of analysts that collect requirements based on the prototyping and feed those back to the data scientists? Yeah, so the question is, do we, do we have a separate set of analysts and, and feed requirements back, or do we actually include the data scientists in the design session? And so we love to structure our teams as what we call mission-based teams, and we talk about the, the tetrad, and there's these four disciplines, actually. So it's engineering, um, it's product management, it's design, and it's data science, all four of these disciplines. And ideally, we try to do all four together as a unified group, because when, when you actually get engineers, and we, some of us engineers are introverts, and we, you get us out of the, the, the deep, dark back room and get us in front of customers, that's when you can really get that deep customer empathy. And then that's what helps the team when they then go back and start building. They remember, oh yeah, do you remember when that customer did that? Or remember when we followed that customer home and at that, at that, at that uh, you know, whatever landscape 
paper, uh, they, they really deeply understand it, and it's worth sometimes taking a half day or a day off and getting off campus to go um, get that deep customer empathy. Okay, uh, a question in the back. You can shout it out and I'll repeat it, or you can walk up to the front and use the microphone. How do we balance the assignment of resources and scale as the mission-based team grows? Well, since we're speaking, we have a lot of mission-based teams now, like basically unused budget, yeah. and, and keeping them and so the kids will play, uh, and people are signing like that. Basically, how do you manage all that? How do we manage all that? Um, I, I'm not an expert in the, in the, in the agile methodology, um, and, but I will say that we really do believe that you can build amazing things, amazing features, amazing products, typically with a, with a, a, a team um, no larger than what two pizzas can, build, can, can feed. And so we, you may have heard this concept of a two pizza team. Uh, our, our friends at Amazon may, be, may have coined the term, but we, we've adopted it. And so, yes, I talked about the four disciplines, about PM, PD, XD, you know, design and, and data science, the, the tetrad of skills, but it's typically more than four people. It might be a team of up to eight or 10. We try to keep our teams really, really small. And then how we actually release all these great features, I'm actually, I, I, hard for me to speak to that particular one. I'll take the next one. Uh, <clears throat> so first I'll start by saying I'm a huge fan of Mint. Uh, wonderful app, so thank you very much for that. Um, I was really struck by the kind of vignettes that you shared, the stories. And I started thinking about my use of Mint and how much I would like to know um, how I'm doing against other people in terms of like savings and retirement. And I wonder, since that's such a like critical problem, um, at least in the United States, have you guys come across any sort of projects or challenges related to savings um, where you've applied perhaps this methodology? Yeah, so fantastic question. Um, the we, we very much, like, this is such a common thing where people want to know, and it's not just consumers, it's also small businesses. They want to know, how, where do I stand? How do I, how do I stack rank up to other 30-something-year-olds who live in, in the greater Boston area or something? And so um, the challenge with this is around um, privacy and data stewardship. And so we have this belief at the company that... Um, that the data isn't our data, actually the data is the customer's data, and we are just the stewards of, of the customer's data, and so we have to, anything we do with your data as a customer, um, we have to do it in a way that matches your expectations of what we're doing with your data. And so there are ways that we can provide that kind of benchmarking, peer comparisons, but you need to have enough data, both to be statistically significant and accurate, so you need to be comparing yourself to hundreds, if not thousands of other uh, people like you, um, both for the statistical accuracy and also from a sort of a privacy. We need to sort of shield your privacy in that group. And so we have experimented with some things like peer comparisons, and often we do it at, at a pretty coarse-grained level, like at the city level, for example, um, not at the zip code level, because we need to aggregate um, enough data um, in order to, to be able to meet the privacy expectations. But yeah, uh, super, super hard problem, super good use of the data, because it can help. It, again, it speaks to our mission of helping, that, helping the little guy or little gal get ahead. Um, which is really what we want to do. Next question. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it was very interesting. Uh, so I have two questions, actually. First, uh, you mentioned that the customer satisfaction is very important. That, you know, you, we have to be uh, empathetic to the customers. And then when, I, I just wanted to know, so when, when the customers being sent out to the pre-warnings, you know, do they take that you know, as offended or... Yeah, so, guess, so the, right, so the question is if, I, if we alert a customer that they're about to overdraft, do, do, we actually, yeah. do we actually offend them? Actually, yes, sometimes we do. Yeah. Um, so we do collect some feedback, um, and, um, and, and I've got pages and pages of this feedback, both, thank you, you helped me um, save this sort of shame or embarrassment of, of, of overdrafting, and actually not just the shame and embarrassment, just the cost. And other people say, like, yes, I know I'm going to overdraft and, um, and I'm, I'm like, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Stop reminding me, please. And yeah, it's, it, it's actually, it's really, really hard. Um, I, a future version of what I showed, I hope someday we'll be able to not only alert them, but actually be able to give them something um, uh, much more actionable, like maybe a short-term loan. There's so frequently that people overdraft on the weekend, um, but then 
by the time their paycheck gets deposited by Monday, they actually have the funds in their account and could, could you just have a few hundred bucks just for three or four days to cover your spending on the weekend? And so we are actually starting to run some, some dry tests. I wouldn't qu quite call them experiments, but dry tests on a, on a possible linking that overdraft with lending so that actually you can click a button and get a, a micro loan just to cover your spending. And hopefully that, 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 that doesn't piss them off, it actually helps them out. That's great. Thank yeah, you. You have, uh, you have a second sec question? Yeah, the second is a small question. So you mentioned the, uh, the broad to narrow and then two methodologies associated with that. Uh, so the first is a brainstorming, a storming. That's very easy to understand. So what is two by two? Uh, so two by two, so you, uh, you may have to look this up on, on, on the uh, Intuit Labs website. The basic idea behind two by twos is that you pick two dimensions. You take all of your ideas and you take two dimensions that you want to, um, to organize your thoughts by. One might be the, the size of the impact and one might be the difficulty in implementing it or something. And then you, and then you pick a quadrant. So you, then you go and you arrange your sticky notes or, or, or something on these two different dimensions. Or the, one might be the, the size of the impact and one might be how innovative the solution is com as compared to our competitors. And then typically, if you arrange your ideas, that can help you to narrow on a quadrant on, on, uh, and, and then throw out the other ideas. And then you can focus on just those ideas. So that, that, that's what the two by two is okay. sort of in, in short. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I have time for maybe one more question. Well, thank you very much.